Welcome back! This time I will show you how you can use the drag component to set up multidimensional drags using multiple drag type map elements. I showed you an example for that on the fourth phase of the puzzle cube I created to familiarize you with the various interactions you can implement using the comp drag. And I will also take the opportunity to show you how you can use the drag component to toggle other state components similar to an interaction component. But before I get started, let me remind you that this is only one of four videos we dedicated to the drag component. Each of the other three videos concerns itself with selected topics all around the comp drag, as you can see from the overview here. You can find the links to the other videos in the descriptions. Please have a look at them if you find that this video does not answer all your questions. As I said before, the drag component is one of the most versatile components of the advanced framework and it's practically impossible to describe all its aspects in one video. With that, let's dive right in. This is the fourth puzzle actor I created. It's as simple as we can get when using the drag component. Just one stationary mesh in form of this plane and one draggable mesh in form of this token. As you can see, I already set up a drag component and a drag latch component for the interaction with all necessary tags and so on as I showed you before in the Span Drag tutorial. So now we can concentrate on the drag type map. As you might remember from the example I showed you, we want the token to move freely in the two dimensions of the plane with sections in the middle of each square. We cannot do this with one drag type since it limits us to one dimension no matter which type we choose. But we can work with two linear drags, one along the token's axis, axis and one along the token's y-axis, and the drag component allows us to do so. So let's decide we want to implement the drag along the x-axis first, which unlocks these three positions for the token. So we choose linear x as first drag type map element and go right to the section set. Here, a bit of trial and error is needed to find the correct sections. We can do this right here in the viewport by positioning the bead as we want it and read out its relative position. I think 0, 32 and minus 32 are a good fit. So let's enter that as sections. Now for the other settings. A snap to segment snap type should work. Let's put 32 as start position and keep everything else on default and let's enter another drag type element. We can use this to implement the drag along the y-axis of the token. And since the plane is quadrangular, we can just copy the section set and other set settings of the previous drag type element. To illustrate my point, let's compare these three versions of the puzzle. As you can see from the text render, the left one has only linear x drag type map element, Middle one has only the linear y, right one has both. And as expected, each drag type element by its own just unlocks the tracks to three of the nine squares. Those combined give you the reign of the whole face of the square, with each square represented by an individual combination of two sections, one from each drag type. The code for this case is a bit more difficult. With a look at this drag state changed event dispatcher, we find out that it only provides us with one section struct, which is updated whenever a new section is reached, no matter from which drag type element the info comes. This does not matter for one dimensional drags, but for two dimensional drags, it leaves us with no way to pinpoint one specific combination of sections. Consequently, we need a way to read out the section sets directly if we want to force the player to solve the riddle by releasing the token on the right square only. Since the drag component event dispatchers won't help us here, let's start with the latch released event from the latch component. The first thing we want to do is find out where our token is. So let's get the drag component and use the get closest segment function it provides. This function returns the section struct and segment value of the closest section to the token from the drag type map element specified here. 
So by using the function once for the linear x and once for the linear y drag type element, we get both the values we need. Now we have a choice of either using the segment value directly or a part of the section struct. In this case, I opt for the first. I want to pinpoint a position anyways, and the segment value directly gives us the relative position of the token along the axis of the linear drag. Assuming we want the violet square in the middle to be the solution, position equals to the segment values 0, 0. So we just need to check if both values are 0 at the same time. Lastly, we just give the player a nice message with this text render. And we can also ensure that they do not undo their progress by disabling the latch component using this function. So now we can move the token freely in two dimensions and put it down on any of the nine squares of the pencil face. And when we choose the violet square, it triggers the end condition with the text render appear. However, this is pretty easy, don't you think? The player can just try and try till they hit the right square by accident. So let's do two things. First, let's limit the number of moves the player has. And second, let's give the player a hint that they can try to figure out logically where to put the beak. Up until now, we connected everything to the red released event because we wanted the player to consciously decide to release the beat at the right square. But that could be a bit hulky for the setup we want to do now. So let's make use of the ability of the comp drag to trigger another component. Let's add the trigger component here and set up the tags accordingly. This works the same as for an interaction component. We just need to give the trigger component an individual tag and enter it here in the components to trigger array on the drag component and ensure the trigger also self boolean is set to true since the comp trigger is on the same actor as the drag component we are working on. Now we can use the event dispatcher of the trigger component to set up the rest. Here we have the event dispatcher of the trigger component. The drag component toggles the trigger component and consequently fires this event whenever a new section is hit by the token, meaning we can reduce the moves and give hints even when the player does not release the token. So now we need an integer variable to count the player's moves and I think a starting value of 5 might be a good fit. For the hints, we can use the section names of the drag component. I will just assign each false section with a zero and each correct section with an X like this. And also another text render to inform the player of the moves will be of use. In the end, I set up the code ahead of time since it turned out to be a lot. First, I created this set text function so I don't have to copy all this code whenever a text render changes. As you can see, it appends up to two strings in two different ways, depending on the text render you transmitted and also sets the visibility. Now at the start of the level, I want the counter to be visible and to set to the starting value and the main text to be invisible. Next, let's visit the code attached to the trigger component event dispatcher. Here, we first want to decrease the moves of the player since they got new information and set the text render of the move counter accordingly. Next, we have two possibilities. Either the player has moves left and can try again or not. So we check for that and continue accordingly. Let's look at how the puzzle progresses first. If there are moves left, we want to give the player a hint about his last move and let him try again. For that, I got the section names of both sections from the comp drag in the way I showed you before 
and put them into the set text function I created, which does the rest for me. And finally, after half a second, I decided the hint should disappear. What to do when the player is out of moves? Well, then the game should be done for them. So I forced a release, which right now you do like this. And the rest I implemented by modifying the code on the latch released event dispatcher, since it is called anyway when I force a release. When the player released the token, we have three cases to consider. First, the token is at the right square. Second, the token is at the wrong square, but the player has moves left. And third, the token is at the wrong square and the player has no moves left. I wanted to check for the win condition first, since like this, the player can even win when they reach the violet square with their last move. For that, I used the code I explained before and on the true branch for this check, I set up the same as before. And to make it completely obvious that the puzzle is finished, I made the counter disappear in the end. Now for the other two cases. Here we need to know if the player has moves left. So I used the same check as before and the, on the trigger component event dispatcher. If they have, we, I want the puzzle to continue. So nothing happens on the true branch of this check. Lastly, the player may be out of moves. This can happen in two ways. Either they make a last wrong move and release the beat at a wrong square, or they make a last wrong move are forced to release the beat by the branch of the trigger event dispatcher. Both ways lead us to the false branch of this check, since the latch released event is fired in both cases. So we want to use this space to tell the player that they failed. For this I practically put in the same code as in the success branch, but this time the text display says fail. Let's try our new puzzle. As you can see, the moves and hints are displayed as we expected. And now, for the win and lose conditions. As you can see, when we run out of moves, the puzzle is terminated and we are told that we failed. When we release the token on the violet square, on the other case, we win, even if it's our last move. I admit, this was a pretty big chunk of information. I hope you enjoyed it anyways and are convinced by now that the rack component is well worth your attention, especially when you want to design triggers, puzzles or other interactive elements that involve meshes moving relative to each other. But for now, I'll sign off. See you soon. Bye bye.